It was a cold December day when we stopped at the Revolutionary War Center in Camden, South Carolina. The grounds were empty as a freakishly strong winter storm approached. Throughout the empty grounds, we heard the slight ting of a blacksmith working. Drawn to the sound, we soon discovered an event that would draw us back months later. The Battle of Camden was a devastating defeat of the American Patriots during the British military offensive in the South. Major General Horatio Gates' army of approximately 3,700 faced off against General Charles Lord Cornwallis' army of a little over 2,200. In the summer of 1780, South Carolina is essentially a civil war between American Patriots and British Loyalists. The majority of the brutal fighting that summer took place between these two groups, not regulars. Neighbors, friends, families, and communities were all torn apart. However, during the Battle of Camden, the Patriots would face hardened veterans on the right flank of the British lines. This will be one of the key factors in the Americans' defeat. On the night of August 15th, General Gates decided to move his forces south towards a more defensible position near Saunders Creek and away from Rugley's Mill. To avoid the heat and humidity of the Carolina summer and to reposition his forces without British knowledge, Gates orders his men to move out at 10 p.m. Unbeknownst to Gates, Lord Cornwallis moves his army forward to attack Gates at a time of his choosing and to deny Gates the opportunity to prepare his army. Cornwallis sets out at 10 p.m. as well. At 2 a.m., these armies will surprise each other along the wagon road in the Longleaf Pine Forest just outside of Camden. After an exchange of a few volleys of gunfire, both armies break contact to avoid fighting at night. Both armies now settle in and prepare for battle. In a few short hours, dawn will come and along with it, the deadliest battle in the Revolution. The Americans will suffer approximately 900 killed and 1,000 injured, missing or captured. The British count 68 killed with just over 250 injured. The Americans, in their haste to march from Deep Creek, North Carolina to Camden, choose a route through an area scarce in provisions. On the night of August 15th, before their march toward Saunders Creek, Gates orders rations of bread, meat, and molasses for his men. Molasses serving as a substitute for rum. But bad bread, undercooked meat, and molasses causes several Americans to go into battle sick to their stomachs. General Gates' deployment of forces follows the European tradition of placing your best troops on your right. So on his right flank is Major General Johann Baron de Kolb and his Continental soldiers from Maryland and Delaware, some of the best soldiers in the young American army. In the center is the more inexperienced militia from North Carolina, and the left flank is largely untested Virginia militia. General Lord Cornwallis follows the same tradition and has, at his right, his most battle-hardened troops. As these troops square off against the inexperienced and untrained Virginia militia, they turn and run from the field. They next focus on the North Carolina militia. As the militia forces run, the Continentals hold the right flank and even push ahead. But without the Americans' left flank, they are soon nearly surrounded. General McCall continually rallies his troops until he is mortally wounded, suffering three gunshots and several bayonet wounds. One Continentals account after the battle says the Kolb is the bravest man he has ever seen. Eventually, the Continentals are forced to retreat through a swamp thicket to the west of the battlefield. In the end, only 50% of Maryland and Delaware Continentals will survive, but their bravery and tenacity will earn the respect of many British officers. Beginning in 2020, archaeologists with the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology at USC found the remains of 14 Revolutionary War soldiers at the historic Camden Battlefield. According to Dr. Stephen Smith, research professor and project lead, the project aims to learn more about the lives of these Revolutionary War soldiers, excavate their remains, and rebury them with dignity. Archaeologist James Legg, who has studied the Camden Battle site since 1980, said many people do not realize that historic battle sites are often cemeteries because the fallen soldiers were buried where they fell during the Revolutionary War and are still there. The location of the graves and dispersal of artifacts paints a vivid picture of the history of the battle itself, including the participants in the skirmish areas. Once the graves were identified and assessed, the SCIAA team, along with forensic examiners from the Richland County Coroner's Office, carefully removed the soldiers' remains and transported them to a lab for further study. Using x-rays to examine the skeletons, the team hopes to learn about each soldier's age, height, and cause of death in battlefield trauma. Uh, this is the 71st grave. This was the only reasonably deep, reasonably formal grave. 
Burial 4. Now, of course, I don't have a photograph for Burial 4 because that is no longer something that we can really do. You can't really do public exhibition of Native American remains. So what you see is uh, my friend Tariq Gaffar's pencil drawing plan of the burial before it was removed. Um, and I can guarantee you, I looked very closely, you can see no human remains in the photograph. So we are legal. Burial 9, I'm doing these in numerical order. Burial 9 was the first, uh, the first grave that was found right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I got a reading on a USA Continental button and I thought I had one individual here. When we excavated last fall, it ended up being five individuals, five continents piled in together. This is also burial nine. And you know, these two people on my left over here keep reappearing in my slides. <laughs> they, they were primarily responsible for the physical removals, and the sophisticated, the, the sophisticated, you know, end of excavation cleaning and pedestaling and removal of that mass because they know what they're doing. Burial 10 uh, was a continental loaded with USA buttons. This individual was so shallow. Uh, you can see that the upper part of that central photo, that is the, the ground surface. This individual was so shallow that if his knees had not been weathered off or eaten away by animals or whatever, they would have protruded from the ground now. Not in 1780, but right now. Burial 11, two continentals. Uh, again, continental buttons. Burial 12 had no buttons, but he had a continental bayonet scab. And uh, he was in an area where the continentals were trying to leave the battlefield, trying to escape from the battlefield. So I am convinced that he's a continental. It's very unlikely. And that, that bayonet scabber tip is diagnostic of the continental equipment and not something British. <laughs> Burial 13, three continents. Also with USA bodies. I also want to point out that something that, that Bill instigated. Uh, at the, uh, the very end of each removal, usually the, uh, the skull was about the last thing to come out. Uh, it was usually the final container of remains that went to Bill's vehicle. And Bill instituted this, this tradition almost immediately that we should have a flag on it for this last container that went to the coroner's vehicle. And so here are shots from three different flag honors that took place during the course of the movies. This was done for each one of these guys, including the British soldier with the British flag, of course, as they left the battlefield. Here is our 71st Highlander, so he is one individual and given uh, a Christian burial by his men with his uh, hands kind of clasped near his pelvis. Um, pretty, uh, the deepest, I'd say the deepest of the burials. Um, he was positioned uh, supine and we estimate he is male looking at all of the features of his skeleton. He was not particularly tall and he was um, an adult, he did not have the signs of arthritis, degenerative change that um, we see in middle to later adults. So, and um, given his his uh, fairly average stature among the men, he nonetheless we think was biomechanically very um, well built, like a brick house. So this this man would have been his pelvis was wide, his femurs are just. Um, uh, very robust. He reflects the muscle attachment sites of someone who has marched for thousands of miles and probably was selected for his imposing physique. So he was um, definitely an imposing figure on the battlefield. So um, for traumatic injury, we have shown the base of his skull, so right back here on the occipital bone. And this is our one of our most convincing ev evidence of blunt force injury. So. He was probably struck, could have been struck with the butt of a musket or bludgeoned with some other um, blunt force. Um, can't rule out projectile trauma, musket ball, canister shot, but 
It does have the characteristics of a of a um, blunt force injury that was sustained at the time of death, and was he was buried with those fractures in place, um, and his skull was incomplete, so part of, parts of the skull were absent as well. Um, we we don't know if that's due to the fact that also that pine trees grew through parts of his skeleton. So. Um, Burial 4, as um, Doug described, we identified him in the process of taking an x-ray and receiving him in the laboratory and cleaning his remains um, as having Native American ancestry. This is based on the uh, shovel-shaped characteristics of his incisors, which are uh, mean uh, Asian ancestry in the context of our history. This means Native American ancestry in the New World. Um, lots of the other guys, we don't have an ancestry estimate because their faces were not preserved. They did not survive. So we can't measure the face and say this person was like the European American or African American. We, we, we don't know. We, you know. we have assumptions about the battlefield and the demographics. Um, the burial 4 was finished developing 20 to 35, we estimate. We may be able to, to refine these age estimates going forward with further study. And he was quite tall, 5'8 to 5'10, and we identified no artifacts with him and no evidence for injury. Uh, burial 9 uh, consisted of five co-mingled uh, U.S. Continental soldiers. Um, and we have uh, pictures here of um, the individuals laid out in our lab in the anatomical position, as well as our uh, the middle picture is in the field, what we were trying to figure out after they've been exposed, just who was who and where, um, as well as a great sketch done by archaeologist John Fisher um, to represent uh, these, these people in, in the grave. Um, they were all supine, so they were uh, face, face up for the most part, or bodies up, sometimes faces turned in different ways, um, and again commingled, arms across uh, each other in some cases, multiple pelvises on top of each other. It, uh, it really took Bill and I a, a long time uh, uh, with help of everybody on site to, to figure out um, how to begin exhuming them. Uh, their age at death uh, ranged from 16 to, to 45, and I'll uh, go through each individual. So 9A and 9B, we estimated both are uh, biological males. Uh, uh, 9A is a, an adult over the age of, of 20. Uh, due to preservation, we were not able to get more precise than that. Uh, a younger individual between 5'2 and 5'5. Five five. And this individual had some trauma, which we have pictures of on the next slide, so I'll hold off on that. 9B, um, so uh, we mentioned that uh, the burial, burial 13 consisted of three teenagers. We didn't realize until we got back to the lab that this commingled grave of five people also contained two additional teenagers, so it upped our number in a, in a surprising way. This individual, based upon his growth plates, um, were, uh, was about 16 to 18 years of age, um, but rather tall, between 5'7 and 5'9, and had no evidence for any skeletal traumatic injury. This is a picture of uh, uh, his right upper arm, so the right humerus, and this is one of only about four individuals that we have what we call in situ trauma. So this musket ball was found right on this individual's humerus um, at the time of excavation. Uh, the image alongside it is um, an x-ray uh, showing this uh, association. Uh, once the musket ball was picked up, it was heavily deformed and contoured to the surface of the bone. Um, and underneath, as you can see in the x-ray quite well, um, a, a very likely perimortem fracture um, that uh, occurred around the time of this individual's death. Uh, two additional individuals, all also uh, estimated to be males. Um, another teenager, this is our second one of the five, um, between 16 and 19, 5'6 uh, five, to 5'8 five, living stature. Um, and he, um, several of these individuals had um, uh, fractures of their thigh bones, their, their femurs, and we uh, think that it's likely due to rough handling of the body post-mortem when these individuals were being put into, into the grave. And we don't see it as, a, as something that they endured during life. 
Um, 9D was between 30 and 40 years old, um, between 5'4 and 5'7 in terms of his stature. Um, and although we didn't have any evidence for skeletal traumatic injury, um, Jim located a musket ball um, near the right shoulder of this individual. And last but not least, the fifth individual in, in this uh, burial, uh, we were not able to determine um, an estimation for biological sex due to uh, very poor preservation. Um, we believe him to be between 20 to 45 uh, years of age at the time of death, and between 5'4 and 5'7. And again, another individual that doesn't demonstrate any skeletal signs of injury, but had um, a heavily deformed musket ball from the abdominal region, which if you recall, Bill talking about the ribs as well as the vertebral column that was, was not well preserved at all. Burial 10 was one individual in a grave, and he was very shallow. The, the femur, Jim mentioned, the knees would have been protruding from the ground. He was likely impacted by logging operations. Um, he is supine, and he shows us some interesting features about the burial. So he's in a position of having his legs um, flexed like that, probably reflecting burial after, during decomposition, maybe a day or two later in the hot August um, sun. So he was like the bloated, decomposing body that was buried. Um, he may have been um, dug into by animals or disturbed by other means. He is shows evidence of secondary burial. So up top in, in the sketch there, you can see the, a, a um, pile of what represents a pile of arm bones. They are stacked like Lincoln logs. They were placed back in the grave. The skull is oriented entirely wrong and the mandible is somewhere else. Um, so he was likely buried by a good Samaritan after the fact of his bones being disturbed. Historical accounts um, mention the bones line, littering the battlefield after the fact. Those who did not get buried or those who were disturbed by um, feral hogs, dogs, etc. He is estimated to be male and one of our older individuals, 40 to 50, maybe more, and couldn't determine his stature because the long bones were not very intact. We couldn't measure a femur that had been plowed through or run over by logging trucks. No evidence for trauma, but he did have a, a buckshot recovered near him and a musket ball near his knee. Um, and as I said, that he shows that sign of secondary burial. Burial 11 consisted of two individuals together, and they were about 36 centimeters deep on average, and they are both adults, 20 to 45 is our estimate so far, um, positioned supine in the grave. 11A, estimated male, based on measuring the uh, features of his bone, of his pelvis and skull, looking at his jaw and features of the skull. He is tall, somewhere 5'7", 5'10" and had no evidence for any injury. 11B was one of, one of those where we found with, with um, radi radiology up front, we found you know, a metal projectile, lead projectile associated with his skull. It's buckshot, which is on his parietal bone. Um, this may have been not even penetrated the skull. This, in autopsies, we often see shotgun pellets that have lost energy um, retained in the scalp of an individual, so he could have, you know, caught some buckshot, and it's it's there. Um, there was a defect underneath the buck, buckshot, but lead is so heavy that when it gets compressed in soft bone, it's gonna, you know, we didn't see fractures or anything. It was likely just in his scalp. And burial twelve is a continental soldier who was a bit disturbed and missing a leg bone, one individual. Um, he was supine, estimated to be male based on the features of his skull and long bones and pelvis. And 35 to 45 was our, our best estimate using certain methods. And he's our tallest individual, 5'10 to 6 feet tall. So um, we did not document any skeletal injury on him.
Uh, the final burial that we'll uh, tell you all about tonight uh, consists of three individuals, and um, this is a burial of the uh, three teenagers. Um, they were all uh, supine, so face up, uh, commingled, uh, less less complicated than the five people, but still um, still a challenge in its ways. This, as you can see, our field sketch with our notes. Um, and just like burial tins, shows signs of, of bloating, so early, early onset um, uh, decomposition and then buried uh, shortly thereafter. And again, these are adolescents between 15 and 19 years of age. 13A, um, it was estimated to be a biological male between 17 and 19 years at, at death, um, with a stature of 5'5 five, five to 5'8. Five, um, and these are images of um, this individual's lower spine, his lumbar spine, the lower back. Um, the first image on uh, this side is in situ, so in the field. This is what we, what we discovered, um, is a musket ball in this individual's spine. Um, and then we you see the radiographic image of, um, of the, the, impact, the impact and um, the one on this this way is after we, we got done cleaning and uh, we're showing this association. You can see that it would have been quite complicated and it could have e easily been missed as an impact. Um, given the fragmented nature and the poor preservation of these remains, it was really critical for us to have seen this um, in, in the field it, itself. Um, in addition to this gunshot wound and his lower spine, um, there was another uh, musket ball recovered in the vicinity of his left elbow. The final two individuals uh, in, in this grave, um, uh, one was estimated as biological male, uh, the other, again, uh, we were uh, unable to determine due to preservation. Um, uh, 13B was 17 to 19 years at death, and taller, 5'8 to 5'10. Um, he also did not have any uh, evidence for skeletal injury, um, but did have um, a musket ball recovered from his right elbow. So one in the left, the previous individual, and this guy in the, in the right. Our final individual, 13C, is our youngest of, of the whole 14 individuals, um, with an estimation of about 15 to 18 years of age, um, based upon his, again, his growth plates and the lack of fusion in, in many places, including the upper arm, knees, upper, uh, upper thigh, um, and places uh, on, located on the long bones. Um, he may have had a possible perimortem uh, trauma um, on his right parietal bone on the side of his, on his, the side of his skull. Back on that cold December day as we visited historic Camden and spoke with the resident blacksmith, he told us of the planned reinternment of these men, America's first veterans. To properly honor these fallen soldiers, every effort was made for their burial to be done in the same way it would have been in 1780, including handmade nails and coffins.
Joe Nick, and I came to the Battle of Camden uh, reenactment or reinterment because my great great grandfather William Nick was with the uh, Maryland Seventh Regiment, Maryland First Line. He fought at the Battle of Camden and was captured at the Battle of Camden and was later released uh, in a Charleston prisoner exchange. Uh, he, per his affidavit for his Revolutionary War pension, he joined three or five years and then re-enlisted. However, I can only find muster records that show that he joined in 1778 and went missing uh, on the day of the Battle of Camden. So basically that's all I know. I feel obligated that I need to be here. Originally, the American Battlefield Trust and the South Carolina Battleground Trust planned on reinterning them where they fell 243 years ago. But any fallen U.S. soldier whose remains are not returned to their family falls under the jurisdiction of the Army. Unfortunately, the Secretary of the Army would not allow any burial of this type. A compromise may be reached in establishing a national cemetery either on or near the battlefield for these 14 men. Their remains were placed in the handmade wooden coffins and draped with a flag. As they lie in repose, many pay their respects. Camden was one of the most pivotal battles in the American Revolution. It was the high water mark for the British during the Revolutionary War in the South. But the Carolinas would never completely fall under British control. Today, the artifacts and stories held in Camden and the Revolutionary War Center tell the story of South Carolina's important role in the American Revolution. Now we see.